I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, thanks for being here, everybody. My name is Kim Porter. I'm the executive director of Be a Part of the Conversation. I want to thank our community partners, uh, the Montgomery County Office of Drug and Alcohol. This is the second in a series of four programs about alcohol. I'll be telling you more about those in just a moment. Um, we are recording this program, uh, but you need to know that your names as attendees are not visible on the recording. Also, any questions that you ask um, through the chat or the Q&A, which we really encourage you to do, will not be visible on the recording either. So that'll, that'll be completely private. Um, but we, we like to record some of these programs so that we can offer them as a resource for folks down the road. <clears throat> you can follow up on this topic on our website, conversation.zone slash alcohol. Uh, Bob Lamb from Be A Part of the Conversation is with us as well. And he's gonna be putting links to resources like this follow-up page in the chat for you. So if you have a chance to check out the chat, there will be some, some links in there for you as a follow-up. You'll also get an email from Zoom in about 24 hours that has this follow-up link as well. Uh, and there'll be a survey that comes up at the end of this that we are hoping that you'll take a moment to complete. We would really appreciate that. So I'm gonna be talking with you a little bit at first, but then I'm gonna be turning it over to some really terrific panelists who are with us. Val Cannon is here from Miramont Treatment Center. Uh, Tom Connell is a therapist and is the co-founder of Ethos Treatment. And Garth Reed is with us. He's also with Ethos, but he's gonna be here to share his personal story. Um, and I think you'll hear some of Tom's story as well woven into this. So I'm really grateful to all of you for being part of this panel. I wanna mention a couple of things that are coming up. We are very excited to welcome back for the fourth time, Kevin McCauley. If you don't know Dr. McCauley, he is the creator of the films Pleasure Unwoven and Memo to Self. Um, he is a um, physician who works in the addiction field today. He is a person in long-term recovery, and he is a master at explaining some of these very complex issues. So his topic, I think, is going to be fascinating, where stress, trauma, and addiction intersect. So I hope you'll join us on Tuesday evening for that. Um, that link is convo.zone slash Macaulay. That's where you can register to attend. Bob, I think I sprung this one on you. So maybe you can drop that in the chat as well. Thanks. Um, we also have a program coming up. Super excited about this. Oh, I should say this one is on Zoom with Dr. Macaulay. Um, but we're going to be in person on March 22nd. Um, oh, there's that ethos name again. We're going to be in the ethos building uh, with Mike Blanche from ethos, but also with Rick Shugart. Rick is a marriage and family therapist and Mike is um, a social worker therapist. And they, the two of them are, are going to be helping us navigate as family members. Um, I'm a family member. I have a dad and a son who are both in recovery today. Um, and so I love these topics for all of us family members, um, but it should be a great evening. Uh, again, there's the link for registering, but I really want you to visit our calendar, which is conversation.zone slash calendar. You'll find all these topics there. That's kind of the easiest way to get registered is to go on that calendar and find these links. And I mentioned that this is the second in a series of programs about alcohol. The next one we have coming up is on May 19th that we'll be talking about under 18. So we're going to just touch on it very briefly tonight but we're going into a deeper dive on May 19th to talk about underage, meaning not even under 21, but under 18, like really that K through 12, um, some things that we can do as parents, as educators, as guardians and caregivers to kind of make things um, go more smoothly for our kids by helping them to avoid alcohol use. And then the fourth in the series will be on May 24th. It'll be similar to tonight's presentation, but we're going to really talk specifically about women and alcohol. And I will be sharing a little bit of info with you tonight about this population, but we will take a really deep dive into this topic um, again on May 24th. So again, you can find these programs on our calendar. And I always like to point out that we have these amazing support groups that meet uh, throughout the week, and you can find information about these on our website at Parent Partnerships section, which is our website slash partnership. You'll find on there, among a lot of other great resources, this calendar, which shows you um, these, these buttons are all where you can get info about the meetings. The green buttons are happening on Zoom. The purple buttons are in person, and the red is one, there is one hybrid meeting. I can tell you that some of these are going to be shifting to in-person in the next coming months, but others are going to be staying on Zoom. 
So we hope to continue to offer a virtual option, but also to have some meetings coming back in person as we hopefully are moving out of the danger zone with the pandemic. So on to our topic tonight. Um, our, our culture does love this substance, you know, from, I always say, from the time that berries fell off of bushes and fermented, we've had alcoholism, right? It's just been a part of the human experience for a very, very long time. And then we have, you know, they have this put in our face all the time. This is, these, some of these are a bit uh, vintage, but, you know, even today, we still get lots of messages about how fun it is, how healthy it is, how big a part of, of all kinds of life celebrations it is, sporting events, everything. I mean, imagine being uh, somebody who's in early recovery, walking into a grocery store here in Pennsylvania now, you it's in your face. You know, it's really, you, you go to pick up a few things at the store and there it is, you can't avoid it. Um, so it's a real challenge for us. And so, um, you know, and the message that this sends is just not great, that it's just such an important, important part of um, our culture. And we know that advertisers have this 80-20 role and, you know, the marketers know that whether it's alcohol, whether it's tobacco, anything that even fast food, this is the 80-20 role of marketing, that 80% of the product being sold is consumed by 20% of their customers. So, of, of you know, this goes, like I said, for uh, tobacco and other things that's happening in the e-cigarette world as well. It's also happening in the cannabis industry, but it certainly applies to alcohol. Um, as one of our presenters has said in the past, the alcohol industry doesn't care about my wife's two margaritas a year, but they love the fact that I used to drink, you know, um, Mad Dog 20, whatever it was, you know, like uh, around the clock, that is who they're after. So um, th there's a reason for all that advertising. Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, celebrations, as I said, are a really big time. This was just a survey that was asking people when they consume the most. Uh, I thought that the New Year's Eve would have been number one, but it's Mardi Gras. And I'm also hearing that Thanksgiving is a big one or the night before Thanksgiving. But, you know, it's just, again, more, more excuses, reasons to celebrate and include alcohol in those celebrations. And then you, you know, you go shopping on Etsy or into some stores in your, you know, neighborhood, and you just find all kinds of ways to celebrate alcohol and to have fun with it and to buy gifts and to decorate your home and, you know, on and on. And boy, we see a lot of this with the mommy juice. Uh, yeah. And here's the way to celebrate somebody's 21st birthday. And boy, this one really blew my socks off. Here we have wine pairings for Girl Scout cookies. I mean, that's that's just kind of what a message this is sending to kids, right? So just very quickly want to look at young people. Um, thankfully, we are seeing a decrease in lifetime use of alcohol among children. So eighth, 10th and 12th graders combined. Um, it has been decreasing. Unfortunately, this survey or this, this comparison only goes through 2017, but you can see a pretty precipitous drop in alcohol use among under uh, 18 year olds. College age um, and, and roughly in that eight, 19 to 28 year old age, they're not as precipitous a drop, but it's coming down a bit. We could do some more work there. Um, but also uh, here's taking a look at just age levels of regular old consumption of alcohol or the blue bars, and then the red bars indicate heavy alcohol use. So the gray area here is um, underage. So these are under 21 year olds who are consuming alcohol. And it's pretty steady age-wise. It takes a little dip as we get a little bit older, but uh, you can see quite a spike once you get into the legal age. And, you know, I'm just pointing out that we rightfully so are paying a lot of attention to what's happening with opioid overdose. So looking at the calendar year 2020, there were 92,000 uh, roughly uh, deaths due to overdose. But what doesn't make headlines is that even more deaths were due to alcohol-related disease in the year 2020. Um, so really important to talk about this subject. It, I just don't think it gets the attention that it needs to, and, and it devastates lives just as much 
um, when you're living with an alcoholic, when you're working with an alcoholic, what it does to the work, work environment and all of that. Um, and by the way, cigarette smoking causes more deaths than both of these substances combined. I need to just make that point. Um, so when you look at specifically alcohol related deaths, you can see that um, more than half of these deaths are the result of a lot of long-term use. Uh, liver disease is number one, um, but suicides, interestingly, um, involving alcohol kill more people than car accidents that involve alcohol. So that's something to be very uh, cognizant of as well. Um, so what is alcohol use disorder or alcoholism? It's a medical condition characterized by an impaired ability to stop despite adverse <clears throat> social, occupational, or health consequences. So that's kind of the basic de definition of any addiction is continued use despite negative consequences. Um, certainly drinking at an early age can increase your risk. That's all to do with the developing brain, which we'll be talking more about in May when we get into underage drinking. Um, and someone asked a question about uh, the hereditable aspect of uh, alcoholism, uh, there is absolutely a huge component to this. So roughly 60% of your potential for alcoholism or other substance use disorders, but particularly alcohol use disorder um, is about 60% likelihood if there is a genetic component. So this definitely um, makes a difference. The way parents drink around you as well, as you're growing up with that, that would be some environmental co contributors as well. Um, so mental health conditions can absolutely be a, a predisposition to alcohol use disorders, such as depression, PTSD, ADHD, um, combining that with alcohol use can absolutely um, have some deleterious effects. So be very aware of that. And of course, childhood trauma definitely puts folks at risk. <clears throat> So you can see how many people over their lifetime have reported drinking alcohol at some point um, versus the number of folks have, who have been drinking in the past month. So, you know, not even everybody who's an adult consumes alcohol. Um, many, many do, but not all, but roughly over half reported drinking if they were over 18. So, um, or yeah, it was over 18 in the past month. So that's more frequent use, obviously. And what is a drink? What constitutes a drink? You can see these breakdowns here. Light drinking is considered fewer than or equal to three drinks a week. You can see that this is how the, the portion of the population um, is consuming that amount. Um, that's a pretty broad range in my view. I'm sure there are many folks who are not drinking even three drinks a week. Um, moderate drinking you can see is about 15%. And then heavy drinking is about 5%. But in this study, they showed that um, in the past year, 33% of folks roughly did not drink at all in the past year. So again, not everybody drinks alcohol. And this, this is a very interesting uh, long uh, time ago. This was put together, this study, looking at this gelinic curve that was, was developed to show the progression. And I like to bring it up with alcohol use, especially because Progression is really key to alcoholism because of everything I just mentioned about the societal norms around this, that where, where is the line that you cross, right? It's really important to think about how it can take years for moderate or occasional drinking to increase into problematic drinking. So just to be aware that, you know, and I mentioned that I have a father in recovery, he got sober at 66 his alcoholic drinking didn't really exacerbate until he was well into his forties and fifties. So um, that's, that's kind of part of this progression is if it's something that's been a part of your life um, and you've never had a problem with it, but then maybe challenges come along or maybe a marriage is suffering or you lose your job or some trauma happens in your life that might really hear you have this, the system in place already for numbing yourself. And that's where the alcoholism can absolutely start getting into this chronic phase. Then this shows relapse. And then of course, pathways to recovery. Uh, we do have a, a source on our, that follow-up page that if you're interested in sharing this with anybody, it's just sort of a, a checklist um, that the DSM-5 put together on, you know, sort of, do you think you might be drinking a little more than you'd like to? And they give you an opportunity to answer some questions and sort of rate what your drinking might look like. 
And there are a lot of effects on the body. We talked about some of the deaths that are, are caused by the disease due to alcoholism, but um, certainly it affects your brain. I'm not going to sit and read all of these to you because this is being recorded. I'll also have this PowerPoint on our follow-up page but not only the brain, um, the heart, you can have heart disease such as stroke and high blood pressure, liver disease for sure, cirrhosis and so on. Um, the pancreas can definitely be affected. Pancreatitis um, can, be, can be deadly uh, and um, it can increase your risk of cancer, certain cancers, uh, and it affects the immune system, impairs the immune system. And that is something that during, especially during this pandemic, we're all very aware of our, the strength of our immune system. And so really want to think about the impact that this might be having on our body. Other conditions that can be impacted are lots of mental health challenges, digestive issues, uh, blood pressure, STDs, and so on. Um, can affect parts of the brain, liver, cardiovascular system, and gut will begin to slowly heal. So there's good news. We can heal from this if we stop consuming alcohol, the body is resilient. Um, and other benefits, you know, our skin improves, better sleep, weight, mental health, all of these things, reducing our risk of cancer, cardiovascular and other things, and improves our memory and thinking. Lots of good news. There are medications that I'm sure that uh, Val Cannon is going to be talking with you about, uh, but there, but I just want to mention that there are some meds out there that can be used uh, to help detox and also to help prevent relapse. So um, naltrexone, acomprostate, and disulfiram are all available to help with cravings. And I'm sure, like I said, that Val will touch on these some more. Um, behavioral treatments, you'll hear from both Val as an inpatient representative and from Tom Connell from the outpatient world about therapeutic interventions that are really helpful. And then of course we have mutual support groups such as Alcoholics Anonymous and many, many others um, that are very accessible, especially now that we have so many that are taking place online. Combining this kind of support with, with uh, peer to peer support is really helpful as a layer, adding on to some of those other things like medication assisted treatment, inpatient therapy, outpatient therapy, and so on. Really, really important to note that there are two substances that are incredibly deadly to detox from. One is benzodiazepines and the other is alcohol. So if someone has been using alcohol heavily and they decide to stop, they probably should be in touch with their physician to, to help them with this detox because it can be life-threatening. So it's a very, very important note that we want to make. I just want to touch briefly on what's been happening since COVID came along and what, how it's impacted us. I'm going to throw some more uh, pictures at you here. You know, social media, we are just being real cute about all this, but it's also it's sending us some messages to our kids, but it's also just universally adding to, um, you know, the acceptance and the validation of use. So just kind of think about what you're posting on social media, please, just especially with the kids looking and seeing that this is such a big, important part of adults' lives. Let's not make it such an important thing, right? Uh, so this is taking a look at alcohol consumption since the onset of COVID. Um, roughly 27% of drinkers did not have a change. Um, a few people, 12 or 13% are drinking less. Um, but 60% of people who were drinking are drinking more since COVID started. That is really something um, to be really concerned about. I think this isolation obviously is not good for a lot of us. It's hard to tell how many of these folks have an alcohol use disorder um, or, but you know, it's certainly something to be worried about. Um, Drizzly is something that they deliver. It's kind of like thinking out of Grubhub for alcohol. Um, they will deliver to homes in Pennsylvania. Only beer can be delivered to the home, not hard liquor, but it can in New Jersey and other States. Um, but Drizzly reported big spikes in their sales after the onset of COVID. And uh, here is a breakdown of um, some use that was uh, discovered through a st study done by the Journal of American Medical Association. Overall, adults were consuming 14% more alcohol in this review. And, but this section down here is again, all about women. So, oops, we're gonna be talking more about that in May, but um, you can see that 39% um, have 
cited an incident of alcohol-related problems. So heavy drinking up 41% among women. So we're really concerned about some of these numbers. Who knows why it is? It could be, as I said, maybe the isolation, but also some depression, negative emotions, missing being with your loved ones, with your, your peer group. Um, but also maybe they're trying to achieve some sort of sense of celebration and having their own, you know, by, by having alcohol consumed in the home, maybe it's just making it feel like more of a festive atmosphere. These are just some, uh, some thoughts about that. A little bit of good news is that because of especially that first year of the pandemic with college students not being on campus, their use went down. So perhaps they were doing um, you know, remote learning from home, so they weren't in the social gathering. It has, it's kind of a double-sided coin. They were missing out on the social connection, but maybe they weren't consuming as much alcohol. So hopefully that was a little bit of a silver lining. Uh, and I just want to mention that, you know, not everyone who is consuming alcohol needs to abstain completely. Maybe they just are getting a little bit further in past moderation and feeling like this might be becoming problematic and they want to dial it back. And there definitely are some um, movements these days with um, being sober curious. I believe a lot of millennials um, are definitely taking this path and interested in just cutting back. So there are all these apps now that are about reducing your consumption. So I just wanted to throw that out there as something to maybe some of the panelists might wanna talk about, but um, that's really all that I have. So I'll stop sharing. And now I'd love to turn it over to Val Cannon from Miramont. So Val, Val would you introduce yourself and tell folks yeah, who you are? Thank, yeah, thanks, Kim. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Val Cannon. I am the division director at Miramont Treatment Center. Uh, we all know that position to be the clinical director. I have oversight of typically the, the detox and the inpatient unit. So most of my presentation will be geared towards um, the area and discipline that I work, which is with the adult population in those two levels of care. So Kim, I'm just going to um, share my screen. Sure. Thanks. Can you see that? Yes, okay. perfect. Okay, so Kim, thank you. I actually repeated a slide here with a little bit of different language, but just defining uh, addiction and alcoholism as a disease. It is recognized by the American Medical Association, uh, defined as a mental obsession and preoccupation that drives compulsive behaviors despite negative consequences. So I also wanna talk about oftentimes people have a mistaken belief that um, alcohol use disorder is just about the alcohol. But what we know is that the disease itself, it impairs belief it impairs thought processes, uh, personality traits, relationships. So in order for someone to recover once they've you know, qualified for an alcohol use disorder, they really need to treat all aspects of that diagnosis and not just the substance of alcohol. So we can talk about progression. Uh, we can talk about use, abuse, dependence, and addiction. Um, there's various stages along the progression. And Kim, you said that really nicely around like this can take time uh, to progress through. And I also want to comment on the COVID uh, piece of your presentation that we have seen this skyrocket much quicker during the pandemic than we've seen before, at least from the perspective that I'm sitting in in the detox and residential levels of care. So use is using something as intended. So we typically refer to this as like your social drinker. I want to go out with my girlfriends. I want to have a glass of wine. I have that glass of wine. I come home. It's fine. I function. I don't do it again for God knows how long. Um, abuse is when someone is using something a little bit more frequently than intended and having minor consequences. So I like to use the example of like the binge drinker. You go out, maybe you intend to have like three or four beers, but you end up drinking eight, nine, 10. You start to have hangovers, you're missing work, you might be late to work, you're having increased relationship discord. You're experiencing consequences directly related to the substance use now. Uh, next, we go into dependence, which takes a long time to get from abuse to dependence for most people. But dependence is now where the brain has adapted to the need for the substance to function and someone is going to experience physical withdrawal as a result of that usage. And then we have addiction and dependence and addiction are different. And this is very confusing for people. So remember, dependence is about um, physically needing a substance. My mind and body needs it. Addiction is uh, the combination of obsession, compulsion and other behaviors in addition to that of the alcohol use. 
So when we talk about progression, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the severe consequences of prolonged alcohol use. Uh, most people are aware that prolonged alcohol use has some pretty significant impacts on liver function um, and the body. And many people know um, the cognitive impact as wet brain uh, when somebody is severely progressed. And the appropriate term for that is Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome, but for the sake of the presentation, we're going to call it wet brain because that's what everybody knows. It as. Um, and it's easier to say, but the point of this is that this is the point in the alcohol progression where there's such significant brain impairment as a result of drinking that it's almost irreversible. So what will you see with somebody who has wet brain? You're going to see memory impairment, processing issues, inability to retain information. You may see coordination, gross motor skills impacted, but the primary presentation is going to be uh, cognitive. When somebody drinks alcohol, they're depleting their body of certain vitamins. That's specifically of a B1 vitamin called thymine. Some people call it thymine, um, which directly impacts cognition and the presentation. So at Miramont, or what most providers do, is that when somebody comes into detox and they are um, they have an alcohol use disorder, we're automatically going to give them thymine and folic acid daily to support their vitamin deficiencies and attempt to uh, repair those deficiencies during the course of their stay with us and hope that we can get back to cognitive stabilization in the early phases. Also, when someone consumes alcohol, they're also potentially impacting their ammonia levels and ammonia is processed through the liver. When somebody has high ammonia levels, they're going to directly impact their cognition. So medical professionals are looking to decrease uh, the ammonia levels to cognitively stabilize somebody early enough in that detox process. Um, there's a medication called lactulo lactulose, um, which... Providers have used for a long time. Patients don't typically love it because what it does, it binds the um, ammonia and it comes out through the stool, but it's very uncomfortable and unpleasant for people. So there's a lot of resistance to taking it. Um, when, when practitioners are kind of defining wet brain, if you will, I think it's doctor specific. Some people will measure ammonia levels, but what we know is that just because ammonia levels are high doesn't mean we have the same presentation cognitively. So more doctors are assessing wet brain off of the actual presentation of a patient. Uh, there is some ambiguity to this though. So let's talk about that progression. So when we got from um, abuse to dependence to addiction, when you're at that phase in the process, you typically are going to need to detox from your alcohol. And I, Kim, I'm, I'm echoing some of what you already said, so I won't, I won't beat a dead horse, but detoxing from alcohol should be done under medical care. As Kim said, it's incredibly dangerous and potentially life-threatening to detox from independently. So please do not try it at home. Uh, best to be under the care of a medical professional. When we do detox somebody from alcohol, most providers are using, using benzodiazepines. It's the gold standard and the preferred method of detox. Uh, the, the type of benzo will change depending on the provider. We happen to use Ativan. It's safe for those with liver damage. Not every benzo is safe for those individuals who have had some liver damage. In addition to the benzodiazepines and comfort meds, we're also going to be consistently performing what's called a CEWA assessment. CEWA is a clinical institute withdrawal assessment. It's an instrument used by medical professionals to assess and diagnose the severity of alcohol withdrawal. So we're doing that um, pretty routinely throughout the course of care, as most providers are, to consistently assess if the medica medication regimen that we're putting somebody on is effective. So we're not trying to over-medicate you and we're not trying to under-medicate you. And what we're assessing when we do that are the typical symptoms of withdrawal that happen when somebody uh, stops drinking. Those symptoms are nausea and vomiting, tremors, sweats, anxiety and agitation, tactile disturbances, um, auditory and visual disturbances. So they might be seeing or hearing things that aren't there, um, headaches and orientation issues. So they're not oriented to day, time, place, et cetera. Um, so as we talk about the levels of care, you know, detox and residential is a stabilizing level of care. So the interventions that we're doing in those levels of care are to stabilize a patient. We're able to dig in and do some work um, with them, but this is just the beginning because remember when we defined um, alcoholism and addiction as kind of the gamut of behaviors, thought processes, relationship to sport, kind of 
significant consequences, this isn't all going to be managed in a detox and residential. So from our perspective, when you, when you get that acute, if you will, uh, we're going to look at transitioning you through an entire continuum of care to help manage your thinking, learn a new way, um, your behaviors. You probably have adopted some comorbidities. Uh, you probably have a pretty distorted belief system, some pretty significant mistaken beliefs and perceptions that are going to impact your ability to stay stopped long term. So again, we're going to continue your progression and slowly bring you down through the levels of care while we slowly increase the stress of life on the outside so that we can teach you how to effectively manage all of that and support long-term remission. So once somebody steps out of uh, their inpatient rehab, they're going to go into a PHP, which is a partial hospital program. I say they're going to, obviously there's gray area. We would like to see this happen. Then to an IOP, which is typically about nine hours a week. And then general outpatient, which is like your one-on-one therapy. Again, it's designed for a reason. As you're so acute that you needed that level of care, you're going to slowly go down. Now, remember, I'm coming to this presentation from the lens of a very high acuity. So by the time they've come to me, they've progressed pretty significantly. But I also want to put a plug in, which I imagine Tom's going to talk about too, is that you don't have to start at the top. We don't want you to start at the top. We want you to intervene early at those early abuse stages where we can get you connected to the support and help at a lower level of care. The earlier that somebody intervenes, um, the easier it's going to be because the progression is not as severe. Their thinking is not as distorted. Their coping skills are not as maladaptive. And we're going to be able to intervene effectively with a, a more rational brain than that of somebody who has progressed. So in addition to uh, treatment, we're going to encourage support groups, as Kim also talked about. So AA, 12 steps, there's many pathways to recovery. Those are just examples. The whole goal of support groups is that support groups are not treatment and treatment are not support groups. And this is important. There's, you know, it's differentiating that for people is hard sometimes. They say, oh, I'm going to AA. Why do I need to go to IOP? Well, because they're not clinicians, right? And they're not supposed to be. Um, and so we're connecting them with like-minded people who struggle with a very similar issue, who can relate, who they can build rapport with, build fellowship with, and build a new peer circle as they're working with clinical um, specialists to actually treat the diagnosis that they have. So in addition to um, therapy, treatment, and support groups, we also have medication-assisted treatment options, as Kim had touched on in her presentation. When most people hear the words medication-assisted treatment, they automatically think of the opiate use disorder. And that's true, and there's great uh, MATs for opiate use disorders, but we also have that for the alcohol use disorder. Medication-assisted treatment is a treatment modality that is used as an adjunct to therapy and community fellowship. And I just want to reiterate, it's an, it's an adjunct. Like, that's the key word, is that it's supposed to be used in combination with um, therapy and support groups. What oftentimes happens is that people develop mistaken beliefs that if I'm on an MAT, I'm fine, I'm good, it works. And that's great, but all that's doing is supporting one aspect of the diagnosis and the recovery process. It's not clinical, it's not treatment, and it's not creating a new peer group of social fellowship. So again, combination. The four um, MATs that we typically use with alcohol use disorder are Anabuse, Camperol, Topamax, and Naltrexone. Let me go back. Okay. Anabuse. So anabuse is a daily pill that somebody takes. It is a medication that blocks the enzyme used for processing alcohol. So what happens here is that when somebody drinks and they're taking anabuse, they're going to get sick. They're going to experience nausea, vomiting, um, anxiety, sweating, flushing. And our patients and people we know have said that it's like the worst hangover you've ever experienced, which as you can imagine is pretty unpleasant. Uh, and people don't want to experience that. The downfall of this is that you have to take it every day. And if you don't take it every day, it's not going to work. So again, there's some accountability attached to this. These symptoms show up within an hour, typically of consuming alcohol. And abuse is metabolized through the liver. And you'll see, I put this on a couple different um, MAT options, because we also know that alcohol affects liver function. So depending on the impairment of the liver, an abuse may not be an option. I am not a doctor. I don't pretend to be a doctor. So I always say, uh, you know, consult with the medical professionals on what's 
physically appropriate for your body, but um, it is important to know that antabuse is processed through the liver. Campbell. Uh, Campbell may be an option for those people who do have some pretty significant liver damage because Campbell is metabolized through the kidneys and not the liver. So it's an option that we can provide for somebody who can't be on like an anabuse or an altrexone. Campbell is believed to restore the chemical balance in the brain that's disrupted by long-term or chronic alcohol um, abuse. So you have your calming and your excitatory chemicals and Campbell somehow just manages that and stabilizes that out, reducing the cravings and the desire for alcohol use. The big negative to Campbell, as you can see is my last bullet, is that you have to take two pills three times a day. Now, can we imagine any one of us in a stable place in our lives remembering to take two pills three times a day I don't want to do it. So now I want you to picture somebody who's newly sober having to take two pills three times a day. There is significant accountability, but we also see people falling off of the MAT because they just don't maintain compliance. Topamax. Um, Topamax is in the anticonvulsant drug class. However, it's used for many different things. Um, jack of all trades, if you will. Um, off label, it's used for the treatment of addiction to curb cravings um, and reduce the urges to drink. Um, doctors also use this for migraines, bipolar disorder, binge eating, and neuropathy. And uh, Topamax decreases the rewards associated with the use. And then we have naltrexone. And when I talk about naltrexone, everyone's immediate thought again is about opiates because naltrexone and Vivitrol are wonderful MATs for the opiate use disorder patient. It also works with our alcohol use disorder patient. It works differently. So with opiate use disorder, it's an opioid antagonist, so it blocks the effect of an opiate. That's not what it does for alcohol. With alcohol, it curbs the cravings, but it can be used for both. It's highly effective with cur curbing the cravings. Uh, it is not a narcotic, so I find myself having to explain this to many people over time and time again that naltrexone and Vivitrol are non-narcotic medications. Um, with naltrexone, it's an oral form, and the person is going to take that pill daily. Uh, again, so there's accountability they have to take a pill every day, but when they do, it does, uh, it does work. Naltrexone is also metabolized through the liver. So this is, again, one of the MAT options that may not be appropriate for someone who has pretty significant um, liver damage. Again, medical professional, always consult them. They're going to be your prescriber anyway. So they're likely going to be looking at liver functions when they prescribe the naltrexone or the Vivitrol. Vivitrol is the exact same thing as naltrexone, except it's an injectable long acting form of naltrexone. It's one shot every 28 days. We see tremendous success with Vivitrol for that reason, because they don't have to take a pill every day. They have to be less accountable to that daily medication regimen. They're more likely to go to a provider once every month to get a shot versus taking a pill. So we see significantly increased compliance with Vivitrol. So let's talk about the family. Um, a lot of times, I'm sure many of you who are family members know, you typically can see the signs of somebody in your, in your household struggling before they can. Um, it's really important as a loved one that we address what we see when we see it, which is hard. And I, I recognize that there's a lot of barriers to doing that. Um, but if we can support somebody in intervening early on so that they don't get to everything I just talked about within detox and residential, there is so much opportunity for success and intervention to possibly, well, not possibly, but to help somebody stop drinking. I just want to remind everybody, though, that when we're dealing with addiction and we're dealing with alcoholism, when we're dealing with any substance use disorder, automatically denial is going to kick in when we get to that abuse phase of use. Because remember what denial does. Denial keeps somebody safe. It keeps somebody protected. It keeps somebody you know, feeding themselves a storyline that they want to believe and everybody around them to believe that allows them to continue to utilize a substance. Denial allows the person drinking the ability to convince themselves that they don't have a problem. So when you're a family member and you're seeing problematic behavior in front of you and you ask your loved one what's happening and they feed you a storyline that sounds amazing, don't believe them. I always say, don't listen to what they say, watch what they do. Um, and not that they're lying to you. They're not trying to be mean. They're not trying to lie. They're so ingrained in the subconscious automatic patterns that keep themselves stuck in a cycle of use that they're not even able to see the unmanageability directly caused by their drinking. So please, if you see it, say it, but try to get them connected to some support. 
if the progression continues and the intervention is kind of withheld until they get to a much further place of dependency or addiction, it's going to be way more difficult to intervene and get them the help that they need. Treatment is going to be longer and it's going to be more acute. Their progression is going to have impacted their thought disorder so much that they're going to have so much work to change and rewire their thinking. So as family members, as supports, you know, you want to hold firm boundaries. You want to have consequences to produce change. Consequences alone will not get somebody sober. And we talked about that in Kim's slide and then my slide as well. But consequences alone will not get somebody so sober. But what consequences do is they produce the need and the desire to change. So if somebody doesn't have consequences, they have no need or desire to change. And that's really important. That can kickstart somebody into asking for help and getting the help that they need. So how do you know when a drinking has crossed the line? And we get this question all the time. And I wish it was one size fits all. I wish it was black and white. I wish it was a puzzle piece that just fits there. And it's not. Um, but we know our loved ones. We know ourselves. So I think if we were to ask ourselves honestly what we're seeing, we may be able to uh, identify some of these warning signs. So the nine things I have listed are things we typically see as abuse becomes progressed. Hiding alcohol use. So are you or your loved one hiding? Uh, are you hiding empty bottles? Are, are you putting empty bottles in the trash can outside, hoping that somebody doesn't see them in your kitchen trash can? Are you hiding full bottles in your closet so that somebody doesn't see them? Are you waiting until all of your family members go to bed and then you're going to drink in the living room because God forbid somebody asks you why you're having a beer? You don't want them to know. All of that are ways in which you're trying to get over, under, and around somebody else knowing that you're consuming the substance. Are you making excuses for your alcohol use? So this is like the line, if you had my life, you would drink too. Or my boss is just a pain in my rear end. I need to drink today. It's very stressful. Every time they have a drink, there's a reason attached to it. And that becomes problematic. Increased frequency of use. Are you seeing your loved one or are you yourself uh, drinking more often and drinking more quantity? Increased tolerance is exactly what it says. You More of a substance, uh, more of the substance to get the same effect tells you that your body is increasing its tolerance and can take in more to get the desired reaction. Are you drinking more than intended? So this is like the person who goes out with their girlfriends and says, I'm only having a glass of wine. Oops, just kidding. I had seven or eight. What happened? What happened is that you set an intention for yourself and you could not stay with that. You drank more than intended. And typically we see this happen time and time again. It's not a one-time thing. It's typically more often than not for somebody. Do you experience consequences related to addiction or to drinking? Sorry, I'm so used to talking about substance use disorders as a whole. <laughs> but are you seeing consequences related to drinking? This is why I want to remind you that defense structures, denial sets in, and we convince ourselves and convince those around us that the consequences are not because of drinking. This is like when the cop pulls you over because you're drunk driving and you're swerving all around and you want to tell everybody the cop was after you just because. No, the cop was after you because you were drinking and you were swerving on the road. But they always have a reason as to why it wasn't about the alcohol. It's about something drastically different. Really important to be able to pick through that um, I, I use the word like the storylines, the justifications, the rationalizations, and really see it for what it is. They continue to drink despite negative consequences, um, made attempts to stop or control usage that were not successful. This is a big one. I can't tell you how many people have to do this. They just have to do this before they get help. Because what happens is that an individual wants to convince themselves and other people that they're okay. They don't have a problem. And in order to do that, they need to say, see, wait, I can do this. Watch this. I don't have an alcohol problem. I'm going to only drink on Saturdays. I'm going to only drink beer because it's liquor that gets me into trouble. So they're setting these expectations for themselves to prove that they're okay. And until they're able until they're not able to continue on with that is the only time they're going to start to break through that denial to potentially recognize that they need help. I will say this doesn't just happen one time. They are going to continuously attempt to prove to themselves and to other people that they're, they're okay and they don't have a problem. So typically, unfortunately, they have to do this a few times over before they realize like, Ugh, maybe, maybe I want to take a look at this. And then uh, last but not least, if they're experiencing withdrawal symptoms, it's a given. I listed them out earlier, but if you see somebody start to experience withdrawal symptoms because they stopped drinking, it's a pretty significant indicator that they need, um, they need help. 
Um, so my biggest message to all of you is that if you notice warning signs related to um, alcohol use, to try to intervene as early as you can. It does not have to get to a point in the progression to where you're seeing me in detox or an inpatient. Let's intervene early enough and get them the support that they need. Um, a lot of times people often say, well, where do I get that help? How do I know? You know, you are not a clinician, you are not a doctor, and we don't expect you to be able to discern what level of care is appropriate for you or your loved one. You're not supposed to. All we care about is that somebody is able to say, I need help or my loved one needs help. Can somebody help me? And there's many amazing professionals out there who are going to do an assessment to support you and your loved one in getting access to the appropriate level of care to treat them. So it's our job as clinicians to assess and evaluate does somebody need outpatient, IOP, PHP, detox, res. We don't want you trying to figure that out on your own. Um, there's, like I said, many providers out there. Um, Kim, I really tried hard to keep it to time this time, learning my lesson from last time. So I'm done. <laughs> Stop sharing. That was great. That was so great, Val. There, I have a follow-up question or two, but I'll, we'll get to them when we get to the Q&A. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much. Tom Connell, would you like to unmute? and share your story and tell us a little bit about yourself first. Thank you. I'll try to unmute. <laughs> Thanks, Valerie. And you did go over Val again, so you didn't keep it within the time limit, but we'll forgive you. But thanks so much to Kim Porter. You tried and... so hard, Tom, so hard. <laughs> <laughs> you get an A plus for effort. Um, thanks so much to Kim and, and also be a part of the conversation. I always enjoy being on panels and, and, and sharing uh, what my experience has been with alcohol and other drugs. Um, and I think it's a great organization because it's a, uh, it's an open forum where people can start to communicate and talk about addiction and other components of addiction and recovery. And it's fantastic. Uh, so alcohol has been around forever. Uh, it's use is part of our American fabric. Almost everybody drinks, although Kim's, Kim's stats showed otherwise. Uh, some people have called it the social lubricant. Um, and most of us use alcohol for many reasons, but when you really get down to it, most people agree it's the effects on our brain. That's the primary reason to drink. Helps us to relax. It's sedating, helps us unwind at the end of the day. But most importantly, it gives some of us that buzz that we're looking for. Uh, so alcohol's pharma, pharmacological effects uh, change with the amount that a person drinks. So in small quantities, it's more like a stimulant, although most of us feel that that's just people's um, boundaries uh, dropping a little bit because of the effects of alcohol. In larger amounts, alcohol is definitely a sedative. And the most important thing that uh, both Kim and Val talked about tonight is um, the impact that alcohol has on our reward system. Just like all the other addictive substances, it affects dopamine levels. And dopamine is one of our feel-good neuro neurotransmitters um, that's um, involved in the reward circuit, when, how we feel pain or how we feel pleasure. So when people use alcohol and they use it, um, you know, several times, uh, uh, what happens is dopamine levels surge, and then when the drug wears off, they they drop. And uh, that's what gets folks into trouble with alcohol, is the surging and the dropping and what we call kind of progression. There, there's other variables like genetics. I think if you have two alcoholic parents, there's a 60% chance that you'll develop the syndrome. Of course, you have to drink alcohol to make that happen. Uh, environmental factors. And also, um, as Kim talked about earlier, life stressors play a role in whether or not somebody can develop uh, a substance use disorder. Either way, alcohol is a dangerously deceptive substance, okay? Now, luckily, we live in an era where there's an abundance of treatment, all different kinds of levels of care. So it's important for families, if you recognize that a loved one is struggling with alcohol, to get an assessment from a professional who specializes in this area. So um, Ethos does um, comprehensive assessments. Um, so what we're looking for when we're ruling out alcohol substance use disorder is uh, we look at 11 criteria. 
uh, or symptoms. And you can, we look at a lifetime use and we also look at uh, the last 12 months of somebody's use. And the big three, most notably, what we look at is changes in tolerance. And like Val talked about, that's, that's when it takes more of the substance to get that effect that a person's uh, looking for, the desired effect. We also look at loss of control. Now, not loss of control, like when somebody's at the un, under the influence and they do something silly. Loss of control, most notably, when I start to drink, am I able to stop? Okay, social drinkers can always stop. But people who have developed problems with alcohol uh, can always uh, can always shut it off. Uh, some people even go go as far to say, I, "I wasn't born with an off switch. I don't have an off switch when it comes to alcohol." And then, of course, we look at all the other areas uh, that alcohol affects. Does it affect family? Does it affect your job? Uh, you know, what are the consequences of your use? Another component of the criteria we look at are cravings. A lot of times people define cravings as, as something physical, but they, they can also be mental. Uh, more often when people, not everybody gets cravings that's addicted to alcohol, um, but a lot of people talk about the mental preoccupation. In other words, um, I'm getting off at four or five o'clock and I start to think, I start to fantasize about taking that first drink or the urgency of the first drink. Um, another phenomenon that we see a lot and that we work with people uh, when they come into our program at Ethos is called PAWS, P-A-W-S, and that stands for post-acute withdrawal syndrome. Uh, Valerie talked about acute withdrawal, and Miramount does an excellent job at detoxing people. Um, but we look more at post-acute withdrawal when they come to Ethos, which is um, the, the 72 hours up to 18 months of symptoms that can occur when somebody's under duress or stress. Um, and some of them are like drunk dreams, uh, again, alcohol cravings, anxiety and moodiness. Um, and sometimes people use other substances other than alcohol to just kind of relieve some of that. Agitation, uh, insomnia, just to name a few. And as I said earlier, you know, these symptoms can last up to 18 months after a person stops all of their alcohol intake. Uh, it's important to recognize, though, that this is a normal part of recovery. It's our brain trying to heal itself. But it can be very uncomfortable and scary for the recovering person when they kind of go through these. And they can kind of hit at any time. Uh, so a person's ability to handle these situational or environmental triggers can make the difference between relapsing or maintaining sobriety. So I'll talk a little bit about what happens when the brain is triggered. A lot of times past memories plus the impact of these memories on the limbic system, the reward circuit or the old brain can produce what's called euphoric recall. This is a big one, okay? This type of recall uh, a lot of times is experienced the pleasant memories associated with alcohol use, not necessarily the consequences. So what we try to teach people at Ethos is, uh, you know, in small group therapy is um, we call it 10, 10, and 10. Uh, if you're tempted to take a drink, uh, what will you feel like 10 minutes after you take that drink? And a lot of times people report, oh, calm, sedation, whatever. Okay, now what will you think? What will you be like ten hours after that drink? Oh well, usually um, you know I'm up to eight, nine, or ten, and and I'm in blackout mode. And then what? What's your life like 10, 10 days after that drink? And a lot of times clients report, well, you know I'm a mess again. You know I'm drinking daily again. Um, to use Kim's example, you know what? You know what triggers euphoric recall? You know the slide that she showed about. Uh, liquor, uh, beer and wine, and now even liquor being in uh, supermarkets, you know, if I was in early recovery, and I'm doing shopping, you know, my usual weekly shopping for groceries, um, I might, let's say I have three, four months over, I might pass by that aisle. And all of a sudden, I notice all the pretty labels, and the cases of beer stacked there, or lined up in the refrigerator. And I might have a thought, Oh my God, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice just to have one beer, you know? And that's what euphoric recall is. Now, the key, what we try to teach people is, you know, think of the consequences. 
you know, don't think of the good memories, but for some reason with you, where euphoric recall is concerned, uh, we don't think of the consequences right away. We think about the good times, you know. Another thing that can trigger euphoric recall is changes in the weather. So when we kind of go from the winter to springtime, always in the groups, people are talking about, oh, I had a craving today. No matter what their length of sobriety, I had a craving today. I thought about drinking today. And I, had, I hadn't thought about it for a while. And it's the warm, warm weather that's kind of associated with the other pleasantries um, that gets their brain there. So he took a couple examples. Rob Lamb was nice enough to um, give us some of the questions that people submitted. So I took the one, I took two of them to just kind of give you more examples of euphoric recall and, and how a person in early recovery has to deal with that. Um, somebody submitted, please talk about the slippery slope when drug users think they can drink alcohol. Okay. And this is a perfect example of euphoric recall, some fond memory or a situation like a party, or it can even be some stressful situation like trying to socialize for the first time at a party could create either discomfort or pleasure associated with past drinking. So the person uh, sometimes will make a poor decision to use again, just based on that initial uh, feeling that they have. Uh, rather than using some of the coping skills that, you know, Miramount teaches and Ethos teaches um, that are taught at most treatment centers, which is, uh, you know, you can leave the party, right? You can get out of Dodge. Uh, you can avoid going to the party all altogether if you feel like um, your brain isn't healed yet and, and that might be too much for you. Or um, if somebody is intent on going for whatever reason, like a wedding reception, for a party, um, you know, we want a game plan with them. Okay, what's your game plan going into it? Do you have any support people there? Can you hang with people who don't drink? You know, can you drive yourself to that event so that if you get uncomfortable, you can leave right away? Do you have a list of numbers of other recovering people um, that you can call if you get jammed up? Um, those, are what, those are what the therapy becomes uh, for those type of things. Um, Somebody else submitted a question um, returning to the college setting where most uh, social events are alcohol based. So the college scenario is a setting where there's a lot of temptations. OK, and a person in early recovery would uh, potentially be hit with a lot of triggers, um, you know, going to parties uh, that involve alcohol. Um, also, your your peers or peer pressure, even the same things that that got people into using in high school uh, become predominant in the college scene. And um, another example of, of uh, uh, euphoric recall could be um, a person wants to go to the party to kind of fit in uh, with their other peers. They, they worked on their studies all week and uh, they're feeling a little bit stressed out and I just kind of want to blow off some stream, steam. Um, but that internal pressure uh, to join their uh, peers or to participate or engage in drinking, again, becomes uh, the main challenge. So uh, euphoric recall will get better over time. So the longer somebody um, stays sober and kind of works through these type of things uh, and allows the brain to kind of heal. For some reason, uh, science has shown us when you get to that 18-month part, 18 month period of sobriety, the brain just isn't triggered as much. You know, it just doesn't respond as much. Um, so again, the key is, the key for all of this um, is timing and coping skills. If the student's on good solid ground in their recovery program, a lot of colleges and universities have counseling centers or have meetings on campus, 12 step meetings that uh, a college kid could attend to gain strength, strength and get support. Or, um, or they could just avoid the, the drinking situations altogether. I mean, the bottom line is we're supposed to be going to school to learn and focus on academics. <laughs> and if I'm paying 60, 120 grand to get a degree, um, why, why does it have to be about drinking? Uh, really the purpose of school is to kind of get through and further your education and become more attractive career wise. So honestly, um, at any point along the way, along the journey of recovery, 
the key is honestly assessing where I'm at, getting feedback from others, hopefully in recovery, who understand this type of thinking, how the brain is triggered. Recover, recovery is an ongoing process. Um, we don't have to test ourselves. We don't have to put ourselves in situations that are going to cause us discomfort. And wisdom, the wisdom comes from a person's ability to work through these situations, especially euphoric recall and pause and gaining true self-worth and really true self-confidence as a recovering person. Uh, so that's all I got, uh, Ken, until it comes to question and answer time. Thanks. Wow, Tom, you covered a lot. That was really great. Thank you so much. Uh, Garth, you're up. Thank you, thanks. Garth, for being there. All right, thanks, Kim. And uh, thanks, Val. Thanks, Tom. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great, thank you. Uh, I'm Garth, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, my sobriety date is June 25th, 2010. Uh, I am an active member of one of the uh, support groups um, that, that Val uh, hinted at. Uh, I have a sponsor in, in that support group. I sponsor other men in that home or in that uh, support group. Uh, and I'm willing to help anybody. And uh, I really want to thank him for asking me to come out and speak here. Um, I could probably spend, you know, I'm going to try and keep this 10 to 15 minutes. I could probably spend 10 minutes just telling you how correct Val and Tom were with all their descriptions of somebody um, going through, you know, what I refer to as active addiction, somebody with substance use disorder. Um, Val put up a couple of checklists and, you know, I went back 12 years in my head and check, 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 check. Um, you know, and that was just my experience. That's really what I want to do. I want to share a little bit about my experience, um, you know, even a little prior to my alcoholism, uh, being active, what it was kind of like at the very end, and then what my recovery has been like and, and try and keep that succinct. Um, you know, for me, the, the big thing where I always start is, is talks about, it goes way back to early childhood and being four years old and having an incident of being dropped off my first day of nursery school and, you know, I, this was 37 years ago, but I remember it like yesterday and being terrified for no good reason and just having this overpowering fear and anxiety. And, uh, and that was pretty much my adolescence for, for no good reason. Um, loving family, you know, great parents. I grew up in a rural community in central Pennsylvania, a great home, never, never hungry, never went without. Um, but I was always, I was always a scared, worried kid um, all my life. And I spent my adolescence trying to figure out why, what I was scared of and how to alleviate that fear. And that took a lot of forms. It took the form of being, trying to be perfect. Um, I blamed things. I thought my, my hometown is, is a bit rural, a bit um, conservative, a bit kind of behind the time, so to speak. So I thought maybe it was this backwards, you know, bumpkin town that I'm in. And, and so somewhere around 15 or 16, I realized that maybe what I needed to fix, what I felt was wrong with me, this constant fear was getting out of my hometown. And, uh, and I set my sights to do that. And I, for me, academics was the way to do that. So to try to be perfect, excel at school and try and get into a good university um, to get out of and away from where I was at. And, uh, and I did all those things. Um, I was completely absent from drugs and alcohol in high school. Um, I was pretty involved in, um, you know, kind of a non-denominational Christian organization aimed at teenagers. I was, you know, involved in that and uh, schoolwork and as a skateboarder and a snowboarder. But um, I even knew back then in the, in the mid nineties that alcohol or drugs might be something that can maybe sidetrack me from, you know, kind of achieving this goal. And so, you know, I made this conscious decision not to partake in drugs or alcohol all the time as in high school. Um, no real drinking in my family. No, you know, my parents very, very rarely dad, maybe a beer once in a while, mom, the occasional glass of wine, alcohol is not prominent at family gatherings. I, I don't even think like a Thanksgiving dinner with, you know, 18, 20 family members. I don't even know if there'd be a bottle of wine. Um, so it wasn't something I had a ton of exposure to, um, one way or the other, good or bad. Um, my experience was then as I, I did graduate, I went to this, I went to this college, I went away in upstate New York. And I uh, didn't think I was going to drink uh, while I was there. And, and it lasted about six weeks. And uh, when I got to this university, I found a lot more other insecurities and anxieties to myself really became prominent. Um, I, I was surrounded by a lot, a lot of very wealthy people, which made me feel very insecure about myself and, and just different people. And, and what I thought were more cultured people, you know, I, I grew up in a town where you got off school for the first day of deer season. And I'm with people from like New York City and they know how to ride in taxi cabs and do this fancy stuff. And I just 
internalized that as me kind of being backwards and maybe less than. And so my experience was that finally, after about six weeks, I decided one night went out with a group of guys to, that I was going to have a beer. And, uh, and I, I drank an eight ounce beer and I drank it quickly and seemed fine. So I decided to have a second one. And uh, by the time that second glass of beer hit the bottom of my stomach, uh, for the first time in my life at 18 years old, the only way I can describe it is <sighs> I was going to be okay. And for the first time in my life at 18 years old, away from everything, you know, 220 miles away from my parents and my home and everything I knew, I finally found something that made everything okay. And I, I, I didn't have a bad experience that night. I had a couple more beers. I had a couple laughs. I went back to my dorm room and I woke up the next day and I might as well have been Jonas Salk. You know, I found the cure for the thing that had been ailing me my entire life. And I decided I wanted it every day. Um, and uh, my, my wife one time asked me if I was a daily drinker from the start. And I said, no, I, I started drinking in October of 1998. And I didn't become a daily drinker until January of 1999. <laughs> and she said, that kind of means you're a daily drinker from the start. She said, why the three month wait? I said, well, that's when I pledged a fraternity and had access to alcohol every day. And, and that was my experience. And I pretty much was a daily drinker every day um, because it relieved those problems. Um, the interesting thing we talk about tolerance, and, and again, I, I think this has been stated, but just to state for the record, I am not clinically educated. I, I don't have any clinical background. My, my education is in marketing and economics and finance it has nothing to do with, with this clinical world. But, but I nod my head at everything Tom Val said, because that was, while it's not my education, it was certainly my experience. Um, I have always had a high propensity tolerance for alcohol. I knew within a year of my drinking, that I drank different from my friends. You know, I was in a fraternity and were there fraternity parties and raucousness? Absolutely. But I was the kind of guy that I had six or seven different groups of friends. So I could always find that group that was drinking that night. The people I drank with Tuesday were different from the people I drank with Wednesday. I drank with Thursday. And that was one of the ways I kind of built this environment around myself where people wouldn't judge me because if I wasn't constantly being with the same people, it didn't look like I had this problem. Um, my alcoholism did uh, progress. There were some consequences, um, but not, you know, overwhelmingly huge consequences. There should have been more. If I'm being honest about it, and we talk about the late stage of my alcoholism, I should have had more consequences. But what's interesting is I managed to have this life that, that the outer exterior parts of my life continued to progress what looked normal so to speak, what's normal, right? I love somebody told me in early recovery, normal is just a setting on the washing machine. And I love that idea. But, you know, it looked normal, right? I got a job and I, I, I moved to Philadelphia three weeks after I graduated college. And, you know, that job, we got a promotion, that we got another promotion, which got me moving to another company and getting a better job. And a two bedroom apartment became a one bedroom apartment and all this stuff. But the whole time, that feeling, that anxiety, that fear was still always kind of there in the alcohol was working less. Now, what's interesting is I mentioned that I knew from the very start that, that I always had, you know, that I drank differently from people. Um, but what I didn't realize was, is I still subscribe to the same stereotypes of alcoholism that I think many people do. You know, I had all these reasons why I couldn't be an alcoholic, right? I have an Ivy League degree. I can't be an alcoholic. I still have a job. I can't be an alcoholic. Alcoholics are guys that have trench coats that live under bridges and drink cheap wine out of brown paper bags. And I wasn't any of those things. And just to wrap up my addiction, this is where it got me to. The two weeks before um, my 30th birthday, this was my life. I was living with a, a woman, a girlfriend and her uh, nine-year-old son. If I went more than two hours without consuming alcohol, I started experiencing those symptoms that Val talked about. So I, what I would do is I would go to bed around midnight every night, hiding a glass of liquor underneath a uh, glass of gin underneath the bed. Cause I knew around three 34 in the morning, I was going to wake up shaking and I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I'd roll over and I'd drink that glass and I'd fall back to sleep, trying to hide it from, from my girlfriend. Right. And this is where that denial thing that Val mentioned can be very powerful, even with family members wanting to deny what's actually happening in the household. And so then I'd finally wake up again around six o'clock and it would be on me again and I'd go downstairs. And I remember looking at the, the clock on the cable box and I'd just grab my, my, my bottle, just the bottle, not even glass. And I knew it took 11 minutes from the time I started drinking until I felt normal. Right. There's that word again. There's nothing normal about drinking a half gallon shatterproof bottle of gin 
at 6.30 in the morning in the living room. And I would drink for about an hour and a half to get myself really kind of normal and calm. And then my girlfriend would go off to, to work and her son would go to school. And then I would fill up a water bottle, uh, you know, Aquafina water bottle. I'd fill that up with gin. And I'd get in my car and I'd drive 30 miles up I-95. I was working up in Bucks County for a software company. And I remember at the very end, every day, getting in my car and wondering if today was the day. For some reason in my head, it's an eight-year-old girl. Is today the day I'm going to kill that eight-year-old girl in a minivan? Because I knew I was well beyond the legal limit to drive a vehicle. And I was doing it every single morning. I was doing the morning at eight, eight o'clock in the morning. And wondering, is today the day I'm going to kill that little girl? And I hated it. And I hated that I was drinking. And I absolutely did not want to. And I had no choice in the matter. And for me, that is active alcohol addiction at its at its near end stages, you know, but prior to the wet brain stuff. Um, big series of events. Uh, I did. Um, they talked about the dangers of detoxing oneself. I did that once. And all those horrible things that Val talked about did occur to me. And I'm very, very fortunate that I didn't have even worse a worse outcome than what I did. Uh, a month after that experience, I ended up in a treatment center. And I actually, uh, with, a, with a smile, I say I ended up at Miramont. And, uh, and that began my recovery. Uh, I did all the things that they outlined. I, I did the 30 day residential program. I did intensive outpatient afterwards. I did some general outpatient afterwards. And then of course I joined, um, you know, one of those support groups, you know, just a couple of things that, that I wanted to touch on just about my early recovery that I think is important is some of the other misconceptions I had, you know, the way I drank, I made, I structured my life so that the only people around me were people drinking at least somewhat similar to me. And so I thought if I stopped drinking, I wasn't going to have a life. It was going to be boring. There's going to be nothing to do. What I failed to realize was how many people do these things without ever drinking. Like how rare it is for people to drink the way I drink. So I got out and I started this recovery and I, I had to change every single aspect of my life because I did everything while I drank and I thought I was going to be bored. And, you know, over the past 12 years since then, my life has gotten busy. You know, it's gotten so busy. Uh, uh, new job, new career, new hobbies. Um, when I got to Miramont, I had early onset congestive heart failure. My liver was shutting down. And I was 50 pounds heavier than I am now. You know, I've run five marathons since uh, since getting sober. Never ran a mile before in my life until I got sober. I've become a golfer. I've become active in volunteer things. But I didn't realize there's all these things out there that I could do because my life was so insulated around drinking and alcohol. And I think that's a, a big thing to really help people understand in early recovery is that there is so much out there, so much to do. Um, you know, I love that Tom mentioned about the change in weather. can relate to that 100% you know, but it was all kinds of weather, right? The weather's getting nice. I used to live downtown in Philadelphia, Rittenhouse Square, sitting outside having a cocktail. But I can say the same thing about a snowstorm coming and bringing two feet of snow. Oh, great. Let's go buy a couple bottles. We're going to hunker down and, you know, ride it, ride out the snowstorm. Um, so kind of having to learn to do everything again. Um, you know, just I'd taken a few notes, but I think really for the sake of time, I think that's that's probably about it. Uh, I would just say that, you know, there there is hope. You know, we, we hear about all this clinical stuff, but there is hope. I was talking to somebody the other day that does not have a lot of experience with this and their, their spouse is going through active addiction right now. And she said, is there hope? And I said, "There's it's beyond hope. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I have a beautiful family. I have a beautiful, healthy two and a half year old son, uh, a two and a half year old son that I'm going to be completely open and honest about. Right. Not just about what alcohol did to me, but about the feelings I had that, that, that I needed alcohol to help relieve. And I think that's really the key to, to helping this is just this open, honest conversations, probably at much younger ages than what one would actually normally expect. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you again, Kim, for having me. I really appreciate it and looking forward to helping with any questions. You know, Garth, you are you are really the best. I, I have to say like, I, I'm so grateful to Val and Tom for sharing all the really important clinical information and all that stuff that I had at the beginning. It just, it's hearing the humanity of it, hearing the real story that just brings it to life and makes it so relatable. It is always just a, a really vital part of these programs. So I'm so grateful to you, Garth, for your transparency, for your service, and just thank you for, for all you do. Of course. Um, Bob, would you, you were going to talk a little bit about, I, I know Tom touched on the college question, but you want to talk a little bit about some of the collegiate programs and things? Yeah, I can definitely touch on that. And, uh, you know, um, I'm also a person in long-term recovery and um, I entered recovery in my last year of undergrad. And uh, it was like a non-traditional college path where it was seven years of undergrad. Um, but, you know, when I was ultimately able to, um, 
make that choice to go back a lot of it you know i was there's a lot of apprehension and fear because of all of like my social scene was directly related to partying and consuming alcohol in excessive quantities and things like that and um you know it was for me it was having a good support system in place um prior to that return um it was having systems set up for you know within the school itself, you know, I had a lot of support from, um, like my academic advising department, the counseling department, like Tom had touched on, um, and then just other peers who, you know, could, could help relate to that. And, um, what I was going through and, and, you know, there was definitely some support there and, um, having that, that supportive peer group is definitely a big part of the college experience. So to have that be people in recovery was, was also uh, pretty significant for me. Um, one thing is, you know, all colleges are really like looking at how substance use is impacting their universities. And there's been a, a very large push to, to actually like have um, established collegiate recovery programs. There's a lot of universities in the greater Philadelphia area that have these programs where it's institutional support that provide, you know, uh, just different types of support services, but it also really highlights that peer support that, you know, um, individuals need. So whether it is hosting 12 step meetings and su peer support groups on campus, but also, you know, some of the bigger universities in the area have, you know, sober dorms, um, recovery dorms. Um, you know, there's, there's the association of recovery and higher education that kind of, uh, is an accrediting body that oversees all of these institutions all across, you know, the United States. Um, but there are a couple of universities in the area that have these programs established within the university. Um, and, you know, when I was at Temple for my master's, um, you know, there was definitely um, a push to have like that peer support group and like, you know, student organizations. So looking for those um, within there, you know, there are supports that enhance and allow people to go through and have that ex like great college experience while maintaining recovery. Um, so I always like to touch on those things. So, yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Really helpful. Um, so I, there's a question about um, sober living. So for anyone, if you any thoughts that you have about um, your experiences with sober living, the importance of it, or where, you, where that lands in the recovery process for in your perspectives, who would like to jump on that? Well, I can, I can start. Um, I know we utilize sober living environments very frequently out of the inpatient setting. Um, there's good and there's bad, right? It's like anything else. I think that one of the things that we really look at for really um, well-established sober living residences is we ask about uh, what is their relapse policies, what happens when someone in the house is drinking or using. We look for structure. We look for accountability. We look for uh, a partner in um, supporting an aftercare plan. So do they mandate that somebody maintain compliance with their treatment protocols? What happens when somebody falls off? What we're looking for here is that we have providers that understand um, the process of recovery and building support systems and maintaining compliance to treatment. We look for collaboration with outpatient providers. We don't want you just being in a house and sending you somewhere and never collaborating with the treatment uh, provider because we know that what happens with addictive disorders is that life shows up outside of the treatment milieu. So we want to know um, when there's concerns related to that. But I think that vetting programs is really important, um, asking a lot of questions. For me, it's less about what it looks like and more about the quality um, of the accountability that happens inside the house. That's just my... Yeah, I think I would just add add to that. I agree with, you know, echo everything Val said, um, you know, this is another area where I think there's just such a lack of education. It can be overwhelming for family members when family members are dealing with the crisis of a loved one, you know, in early recovery, going through getting treatment, and whatnot. And I would suggest, you know, I don't want to speak on behalf of Miramont, but I feel like Val would agree with us, but I know at ethos call treatment providers that you trust and ask them for recommendations or even ask them about other places. Like I know at ethos, you know, again, I'm not clinical, but I have a lot of experience with these things. I love getting phone calls like that. We encourage people to call us. We love referring people to providers that we know and trust. We've done a lot of that vetting and, you know, a fancy website does not necessarily mean a good sober living, you know, environment. So I would say call professionals and ask their recommendations or ask their input on it. Right. And, and folks stay tuned because Bob and I are working on from in the, on the back end here, it'd be a part of the conversation. We're working on a program that we don't have a date for yet, but 
but we will be posting that hopefully soon. We're going to be talking specifically about this, this question, you know, how to navigate the search for recovery housing, because there are so many different levels of care structure, all that sort of thing. So more, more on that to come. Um, and I also wondered if you guys could um, follow up on something about tolerance, especially Val, you were talking about tolerance because, you know, people with alcoholism or alcohol use disorder, um, once the tolerance goes up, it may not be obvious to the loved ones that they're drinking alcoholically because of that tolerance piece. So um, it, there, there may not be the, the falling over, the stumbling around, the, the slurred speech. Some, there certainly can be, but in some cases, it really goes under the radar sometimes when that tolerance builds um, until they have the health problems that come with it, right? And they're really, you know, in my dad's case, it was a bleeding ulcer and, and that sort of thing. So um, can you talk a little bit about other other indicators, like when you know your spidey sense is telling you something's not right here, but if you can just talk more about that tolerance, I'd appreciate it. Well, sometimes some, if, if a guy comes into my office and he's 40 years old and he's drinking a, a pint a day or a half a fifth a day, <laughs> it's obvious he has high tolerance, but he may not be in touch with um, any of the other stuff, the, the withdrawal symptoms that we talked about earlier until he stops alcohol use. And so a lot of times I'll, I'll follow up that with, with asking a person, have you ever tried to stop? Have you ever, you know, not drank for a day or two or three and, and seen what happens? So um, I don't know if that's an answer to the question, but sometimes you find out really where a person's tolerance is um, if they stop drinking. And then you'll see all the symptoms that we kind of talked about. Uh, but you're right, Kim, like uh, people, you know, you know, a lot of alcoholics may not get a DUI because they're used to driving with a lot of alcohol in their system, as opposed to the college kid who drinks, just drinks too much one night and gets pulled over by the police because they rolled through a stop sign, you know, or they were swerving. Um, so it is a tricky one. But remember, that's just too, you know, when you go to a professional and you're getting assessed. Um, you know, we look at all that. We look at all the symptoms, not just tolerance. Um, so the best thing a family member can do is, um, you know, if you do have concerns, taking a, taking a uh, mindset, approaching in a loving way and saying, hey, look, I'm really concerned about you. Can you go talk to somebody? Can you just go talk to somebody? Can you just go for an evaluation where you can, you, know, you can have somebody that's seasoned that can kind of take a look at, um, all those things. We kind of have a joke in, not a joke, but in the addiction business, you know, if somebody tells you they drank, they drink two drinks a day, we automatically in our head up at the four or six <laughs> to factor in the, the denial component that, that Valerie was talking about. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, if I can just piggyback real quick, cause I think yeah. Tim, that was a really good point that truthfully, I didn't really think about that in the presentation either that, you know, tolerance, it's, if you're hiding or you begin progress, you're typically the only one who would know that if you really sat down and thought about it. Um, unless, you know, sometimes when people are openly drinking, you can visibly see that they're consuming more uh, quantity before they get what you know is drunk for that person. But um, that is more of a hindsight, I think, as Tom's kind of saying, and that's, we look at the bigger picture. Um, but I do want to say it was a great point because I didn't consider that before. And I just had just yeah, one, real quick um, from experience that other family members and, and, and family members of friends in recovery, you know, point out if something seems odd, it probably is. And that's where like the denial you can see can be dangerous. Right. So like that's odd that there's three empty bottles in the trash. Like why? Yes, that's odd. Right. And, and there's a lot of, I can speak as an alcoholic, a lot of things I did to hide it right? Taking recyclables out at different times and different trash cans and stuff. And just, you know, that denial can be so powerful that we want to believe everything is okay. As family members, we want to believe everything is okay because that's easier. But if something does seem odd, it might be worth questioning a little bit further. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm down back to my, my experience again with my dad, um, you know, that I remember, I remember one time when we moved into a new house and my dad came to, to help 
with like, you know, installing things or whatever you do when you move into a new house. He had an excuse for errands constantly. He was always like, oh, I'll run out and pick that up. I'll run out and pick that up. And he'd be gone for a while, you know, so I, it, we just, I think we were still in some denial about it, but yeah, it's, it's so tricky. And, you know, so family members don't beat yourselves up if you don't catch these things, because sometimes alcohol is really working for somebody for a while. It's helping them with their anxiety. It's helping them with other things that are struggling with. So it becomes their, their way to self-medicate, self-soothe or whatever. It's not until it becomes, you know, the progression happens that the fallout really happens. And then we're like, where was I? How did I miss this? But it's, it really is pretty easy to, to kind of fly under the radar. So, um, you know, d- don't beat yourselves up if you're missing this stuff. Um, I think that we attached, uh, addressed the question about um, genetics. Uh, someone asked if alcohol is, her- is hereditary. It absolutely is um, looking at that family tree and really any any kind of um, even process addictions, behavioral, you know, any, any addictive tendencies, uh, somebody can have a gambling history that that might indicate that there's a predisposition to um, any kind of substance use or misuse or addiction being a problem. Um, And there's also a comment um, that this uh, person says that they're horrified by 10th graders attending 12th grade parties. Why are parents accepting drinking at these ages? Um, I definitely have some thoughts about this. Does anyone else want to chime in first? (laughs) I have no idea. <laughs> like, why, why would you want the liability these days? <laughs> I know it, you know, when I drank in the 70s and I'm aging myself, Ken, uh, you know, that was the norm. You know, in high school, parents often hosted keg parties, uh, you know, that kids would get wind of and we would go to. But, um, you know, it's kind of surprising in today's climate that just, to just hear that when I saw that question, not that we don't know it exists, but, you know, but, but that a parent would kind of host that, but I imagine it's, um, you know, I imagine, you know, maybe I'm generalizing, but I imagine it's the parent who maybe doesn't have a pulse on uh, where things are at or the parent that's trying to be cool rather than a parent, you know, uh, being a parent of three daughters who are grown, you know, it's hard being a parent. It doesn't always mean being, their friends, you know, there's a lot of teaching involved. And sometimes, uh, you know, we, uh, we have to make our kids toe the line. You know, I've often, the best thing that I had with my kids in terms of uh, discipline was uh, taking the cell phone away. Usually they would snap right back into compliance (laughs) with that one, but I have no idea why (laughs) parents would be hosting I, it's, I don't work with adolescents. So I'm not even going to pretend to have expertise in this area, but um, I'm younger than you, Tom. I don't know if you knew that, but I'm younger than you. Um, <laughs> I've been closer to that, but I, I no, I really have to say just a little bit. Um, I really, my initial thought, Kim, is just despite the age is that I think we're in a culture where we struggle to set boundaries and limits and we struggle to say no, which kind of goes hand in hand with Tom's like we're not friends with our kids. I thank God my oldest is 10. I have some time to get here. Um, But I mean, I see it all the time with, you know, alcohol use, alcoholism, addiction is that boundary setting is very, very challenging for people. You know, we don't have the tolerance for people to be upset with us anymore, including our family members, our kids. So we want to be liked. We want to be um, like Tom said, the cool person. That was my thought, but it doesn't come from any type of clinical expertise. Well, I, I can tell you that we work with families a lot. We do a lot of programs in conjunction with school districts where we're doing sort of prevention for the parents. So we're talking to parents and what comes up a lot is they want them to learn to drink responsibly. They would rather they drink at home than out when they're going to drive. So we take their keys or if they have friends over, we make sure the parents know and we serve them some alcohol. And I guess there's some logic to that, but what we always explain is this a, it's not legal. So you're making a choice with your child knowing that you're making a choice to do something illegal because it's that important that you have alcohol. So what is that message? And who, by the way, only wants to consume alcohol in the presence of their parents? Once they know that they have 
carte blanche to drink. They're not going to listen to the part about only here, only if you don't drive. No, they're going to just know that you're cool with me drinking. Um, and somebody commented, the parents want kids to be accepted and cool. They want to be friends instead of parenting with responsibility. There's so much to lose, which is so very true. Um, but, you know, I, I have to say it's, it is, it, it ha- we hear it so often. Um, and I remember talking to a mother who said, you know, my kids are going to parties where the parents are there. One, one situation was a school board member was serving alcohol to the kids. Um, and, and just, you know, she wanted to out them. She wanted, and the, and another friend of hers, an adult friend said, you're ruining your son's senior year. You know, you're going to embarrass him. I mean, this is, and she felt like this lone voice, but she, she was the only sane voice, you know? So it just is so disturbing that societally we are just so in love with this circling back to our topic title here. You know, it is our drug of choice, unfortunately. So we have a big uphill battle. We're at 831, guys. I want to thank you so, so much. Oh, here's another really quick one. Taking keys is dangerous, illegal, and God knows what meant. Yeah. Taking keys, by the way, kids know about this. So they bring an old set of keys to the Volkswagen the family hasn't had for 10 years. They're very resourceful. So taking keys is not a safety measure. Um, But anyway. Um, thank you guys all so much. The recording for this will be available tomorrow. Um, please take the survey that comes up at the end. You'll see it pop up. We really, really love to hear from you. We love to hear, um, topics you want to hear in the future, feedback on tonight's talk, anything we'll share it with our participants, anything that you would like to, uh, share with us, please take that survey. Thank you so much to Val, to Tom, to Garth, to Bob, to all of you who joined us tonight. Thank you very, very much.